love my HBCU. And Bob, I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man, I hope my team they won one. I hope my team they won one. Yeah, man. I hope my team they won one. I hope my team they won one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team want to lose. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Talking about Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. Talking about. They compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want to lose. Yeah. And who's the ball? Who's the ball? This is Dr. Ville with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike is out on assignment, but Charles is in the building. We plan to have a great show with you today. We even bring an interview to give you some insights of what does it mean to get ready for seeking an opportunity to play at the professional level. We'll tease out and give you a little more about that later. But let me say, Dr. Ville's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington. Charles Bishop, welcome to episode 250. Man, can you believe it? 250. 249 in the can. 250. That's that's pretty special, man. Another milestone. Another milestone. What you think about man. that, man? Yeah, you know, when you take a look at it over the breadth of the years, this is another milestone. And just to watch uh, the way that the brand has grown and the way we've grown, the, the number of people who we've interviewed, uh, it's been one heck of a ride. So number 250, you can't complain whatsoever about that. Longevity. <laughs> I like that. Longevity. Good word. Good word. It's a little bit. I see you, y'all. <laughs> Welcome to episode 250 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab Radio Show and Podcast, the show that's covering the sporting HBC dash from all things HBC sports, from institutions large and small, from NAIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBC sports culture, HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs and the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Kavilla, along with my co-host, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. We're filming from my home studios and sending a signal live to our KCOH 1230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer. That's Ralph Cooper in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. With that being said, let me start off with some shout outs, man. I just feel good. It's 250. I'm going to give a shout out because we don't get to 250 unless we have the lab listeners doing what they do. So I'm going to start with them before I bring you back in and get your thoughts of what's going on in the HBC world today. Troy Franklin, Chump Hunt, Thomas Einstein Maddox says, hey, guys, no doubt about it. Franklin says, SU in the house. I like it. Southern in the house. Ricky Burton in the house as well. He said, we in the lab, baby. Yes, we in the lab. Chris Tucker Karen Griffin, greetings from Southern California. Is it warm in Southern California right now? Because you know it never rains. Yes, <laughs> hashtag through 50. G Boom Holly, 50 is a milestone. Yes, I appreciate it. We don't get there without y'all. AD Drew, watching the lab from the road again, heading back to Georgia. Heading back to Georgia. That sounds like a song. From handling business in South Carolina State. Yeah, we appreciate you. Keep handling that business. We like it. Aubrey Parker says, good afternoon, lab listeners. Yes, it is a good one. It's warm here in Texas. We're getting a little bit of this true spring weather. I guess that really means it is baseball and softball. We'll get into that a little more later on. Ricky Burton chimes back in and says, we in the G this weekend. GS spring game. Yes, yes. Taking that next step. Anthony Wilson says, what's up, everyone? Karen Griffin continues. It's a little cool here. Okay, I understand it. It gets like that sometimes in Southern California, but you did not say rain, so it must be all good. Gabe Lewis, brother Gabe Lewis in the building. I see you, Gabe. Appreciate you checking us out. With that being said, we'll come back and shout out some more folks in here coming into the lab. We appreciate you, as you always do, show us the love as we discover the HBCU frontier. Charles, what's on your mind today? Yeah, let's take a look at a little bit of news going on around HBCU athletics. The SWAC Alumni Association announces the Legends Award and roast. The SWAC uh, uh, Alumni Association has announced its slate of individuals who will be honored uh, during its Legends Awards and roast on Saturday, May 28th, 2022, in conjunction with the SWAC 
Baseball Tournament. The event will be held at Double Tree uh, by Hilton, Birmingham Perimeter Park. And the uh, this year, the honorees, the list of four uh, individuals, include uh, to receive the Lifetime Achievement Award is a former Jackson State University baseball coach and athletic director, Robert Braddock, current SWAT commissioner, Charles McClellan, mm. who also excelled as the athletic director at Prairie View at Texas Southern, former SWAT women's basketball official, Brenda Lawrence Free, and the late Audrey Ford, who served as the head volleyball coach at Texas Southern University. The Chuck Prophet Wagon Master Award honoree given annually to current staff member for meritorious service to a swag member institution. That honoree this year will be LaShondia Sean Nelson of Mississippi Valley State University Athletics Travel Coordinator. The prestigious Dennis Thomas Distinguished Service Award will have co-recipients this year, Dr. Gabriel. This year, uh, Grandma State Football's legends, Doug Williams and James Shaq Harris, uh, will be honored with the Dennis E. Thomas Distinguished Service Award. And finally, the roast for the evening. The guest of honor will be none other than legendary Mississippi Valley State quarterback Willie Satellite Titan. A uh, host of celebrities will <laughs> roast Titan. So uh, tickets for the Legends Award and roast are $75 and or $600 for a table of eight. So you can find out all that information on the SWAC uh, website uh, as far as uh, getting all the information that you need on the SWAC uh, awards and, and roast coming up. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, it's, I plan to be uh, in Birmingham baseball, so I'm certainly going to make sure I get my tickets. That should be a great event. Good names. Man, that's going to be hilarious to see what they're going to have to say about Charles. Uh, <laughs> Doug Williams, Shaq Harris, that ought to be good as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, yeah, that's a lot of good fun listening to some of those stories. So it should be a good affair. I want to get into a little bit of history before we get too much further along. You know, it is Women's History Month. Obviously, we can find a way to tie it to HBCUs. Tuesday, we honored uh, Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes, and she became named uh, the full-time GCAC commissioner, getting the interim removed. But I wanted to go back in the vessel a little bit. Take you back 40 years ago, HBCU played in the first Women's Final Four. Yeah, let me say that again. People might get a pause there, and then once they hear it, they'll be like, yeah, that's right. Yes, that was 40 years to this year, 2022. HBCU played in the first women's Final Four. Today, the program is pretty much gone. Cheney basketball story has been lost to history. This was brought to you by Sports Illustrated. Uh, talked about this a little bit a couple of years ago when we were just talking about some facts about HBCU basketball history. But uh, four days before the selection Sunday, as you talk about this article, as it kind of goes back down the time capsule and gives you some reflection of what was going on at the time, one college basketball's most hallowed halls lies almost entirely dormant. Only a single person, Tamina Bagby, the director of athletics at Cheney University, Pennsylvania, is inside the working in her office, a mere chest pass from the entrance of the arena. You know, we talk about this sleepy Wednesday in mid-March, the gym's retractable bleachers are pushed in, um, but that was not the case when you talk about March in 1982, as Cheney pushed to be in the first ever women's NCAA tournament instead of what turned out to be the final AIAW tournament. As the national official governing body of the women's college athletics shifted and combined in, and uh, moved into the NCAA, if you would, as a lot of programs uh, moved their women's programs under the governance structure of the NCA. The team cruised past Auburn in its opening NCA opener to the then defeated North Carolina State in Raleigh by 13 points. Yes, I'm talking about Auburn out of the SEC. That's North Carolina State out of the ACC. And that was by 13 points to win its second round matchup. Days later, the Lady Wolves margin of victory grew to 22 points in the Elite Eight as they knocked off Kansas State. Yes, yeah, Kansas State of the Big 12 now. At the time, you're talking about Big 8. In advance to the Final Four, playing in the NCAA Final Four, Cheney beat Maryland. Yeah, that's Maryland now, the Big 10, formerly of the ACC. 76 to 66, stretching its win streak to 23 games. Nobody had ever heard of an HBCU doing what they did, end quote, 
as Deborah Walker says, but there was still one game left to win. Valerie Walker, the Lady Wolves leading scorer, recorded 14 of her 20 points in the second half, but Louisiana Tech proved too difficult to overcome behind star forward Pam Kelly. When the final buzzer sounded, the arena scoreboard read 76 to 62. Jenny had lost the first time in the last 24 tries as they lost in the final game of the inaugural NCAA Women's uh, Championship, if you would have it. A lot of great history there. Um, saw some clips. And so we'll post this in the thing. If you go to Sports Illustrated, you can actually get a great story that gives you some insight of what took place the day of the game and just some insights in terms of what was taking place. Shout out to Vivian String in terms mm-hmm. of what she was able to do, the legendary coach that we've seen on different levels. But mm-hmm. oftentimes – uh, we don't necessarily talk about the humble beginnings. And one thing in that article that I thought was fascinating that you hear in terms of the collective memory and understanding and telling our story, she was actually at Cheney as a professor. Wow. Teaching, you know, physical education at the time, or what we would now call in some areas sport management because she was uh, helping individuals that would go into teaching that or at the collegiate level and become athletic administrators what she was focused on. And then she coached basketball, did not get paid for that. She was only paid for the professor side. So she did that without, but loved every minute that she quoted in there and check this tidbit out. Not only did she coach basketball, because you know, at that time, think about it, coaches coach multiple sports. She also coached the volleyball team. Wow. So fascinating in terms of great history in this article, um, but I thought it was going to be appropriate time to make that connection. And every once in a while, you know, we do those things here to show you a little bit of the history of HBCU sports. And this is certainly significant. Shout out to Cheney University in terms of uh, setting the pace for HBCUs at that time in the 80s, particularly on the women's side of things, uh, as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of Cheney playing for uh, NCAA National Championship, making it to the Final Four, uh, which we know um, is unprecedented in terms of what that looks like now. And you heard some of the names that they chopped down on their way to the championship. So we see the difference in terms of the financial windfall and how that gap has grown. But it gives you a finite place to kind of talk and see uh, how special these institutions were and continue to be in terms of setting the stage for history to take place. So I really wanted to share that and take a, a little more time than we normally do to kind of introduce that. Obviously, I'll turn it back over to you, Charles, and just get your thoughts on some of that before you may want to go in a different direction. No, I mean, I think that's fascinating, especially when you talk about the time period and we're kind of looking at that time period. It's sort of the last vestiges of those elite athletes uh, being at HBCUs as we transition from uh, the, the, the late 70s into, into the early 80s. Uh, so that tidbit with Cheney State making it all the way to the Final Four uh, just a few years earlier, you know, uh, Alcorn, uh, 1978, knocked off Mississippi State and NIT. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, you kind of, you know, kind of connect all those things together in terms of those elite athletes being at HBCUs. And are we now in the midst of a renaissance of seeing those elite athletes come back to HBCUs? So to tie that history part back in, that's phenomenal. Yeah, that's a great point when you talk about what just took place in this 40th anniversary, an uptick in terms of the talent surgeons of what you could do at that very level. You know, in the book here, when we talk about the Black experience of athletes, uh, we look at that history. And, you know, I call that time period the golden era. Before that, I mm-hmm. call it the Renaissance in the 50s and 60s, where you start to see this huge significant climb. So it, as you talk about it, it'd be interesting to kind of see this maybe as a rebirth. Uh, as you said, about uh, what was the renaissance in the past. So that's a way to look at it. Uh, let's get into it. Let's get in this break so we can be back with this uh, great interview that we believe will bring you to share you and give some more impetus in terms of women's basketball to make sure that we do what's necessary to shine a light on women's sports, women's basketball, particularly during this Women's History Month. So we'll get in a little bit more of that. So stick with us. We'll be right back at this break, and then we'll tune in and get a little more into the baseball, give you some more softball, some midweek games. Uh, Texas Southern had a big win this weekend. We might get a chance to talk a little bit about that, uh, not only through the weekend taking the series, but midweek games. They got a big one as they hit the road, as they continue 
to show that uh, Texas Southern is starting a little earlier than they usually. Uh, yeah, they are. It's scary out there. Yeah, I like yeah. to hit your head. I'm kind of like that too. Really? Oh, really? Well, let's get this break and we'll be right back with this Dr. Ville inside HBC Sports Lab. Before we get in this break, let me give a little more out there because I see Michael Ford has slipped into the back of the building. No, no, Mr. Ford. Come on up to the front. You know, you know how we do it. You're all right. It's all right to be late, but you slipped in here. Come on up to the front. I see you talking, Chuck. Come on. G Boom Holly says spring football is in effect. Yeah, we'll get in a little bit about that. People are getting excited. We got Mary Allen, Miami in the building. Yes, the great city of Miami. Look at that. Arthur Grant Sr. doing the thing. Anthony Weston is talking a little noise here. Ain't in baseball series against Ham. You scheduled for Friday, Saturday. Had to relocate because of storm damage. Okay, great update yeah. there. Uh, yeah. Keep us updated on how that goes. Willie yeah. Totten, uh, a Sigma man. I see you, Thomas I start Teach, teach, man. I see you out there, teach. Representing, I see you. I see that blue out there getting it all over. Don't get too loud over here with the Sigma stuff. Bro. The Shan Harris, you know, we roll it back this grilling and with all that. John Jenkins, Brian, Brent. Brunson, Wendell Davis, brother Wendell Davis, alpha man, I will say. Uh, Kevin Demetrius Crum Jr. is in here. Appreciate the love, Mr. Crum. I see you doing your thing. With that being said, we'll get into this break. We'll be back into the second quarter and get you into this interview. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell leadership principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvée. Supermarket sushi, really? No, wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? <laughs> oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. <laughs> never not working. Never not working. Never ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working. Standard protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www. Dot slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco.com. Are you hungry? Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want to allow you and who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And pay attention because he's going to teach a This is Dr. Bill with Inside HBC sports lab with mike wash and charles bishop as we said mike is out on the break well it's time for our interview we have none other than brian adams walk on state is that is, is 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 that correct is that where you connected to it goes back brave nation out there brave nation man that's 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 what it is and you pronounced it right <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate it yeah, yeah yeah you know we i work at it i work at it trust me um yeah. thank you Let's just get let's just get it all out there. Wanky, where, where did Wanky come from? Man, that's 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 my childhood nickname, man. Um, oh, it people, goes back to a childhood. Okay. Yeah, childhood, man. It's like it's like Snoop and Magic, man. Hey, they they don't call Magic Irvin. They don't call Snoop Calvin. A lot of people don't call me Brian. So, <laughs> so man. Well, we, 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 we we like to think we're comfortable with friends, but we will keep it professional. So we say Brian, yeah. but if it slips in there, you know we really getting rolled. When we get it. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> all we good. Slide in there. Yeah. <laughs> but tell us a little about where you're from, where you're born, and those kind of things. Oh man, I, I grew up in Macomb, Mississippi. Uh, you know, I had two loving parents, uh, only child growing up. Uh, I attended, you know, uh, the Piney Woods Country Life School. Uh, I had transferred there, you know, uh, after my eighth grade year. 
uh, it's a school, you know, all black boarding school near uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Mm. And, uh, you know, when I left there, you know, uh, I, you know, I had, had a great career uh, in high school, man, you know, being one of the top 20 players in the country and, and chose to attend the HBCU, man. And, you know, uh, for some reason, man, that was, uh, that has been overlooked, but you know, it's all good. Hopefully uh, one day my story will be able to come out too, you know? Well, you're going to tell a little bit about that story right here. So we're going to at least start it and make sure people <laughs> understand it. Before we go too far, we're not going to sl slip over that boarding school. We don't yeah. necessarily hear a lot of African-American black folks that get a chance. And it's my understanding that now, historically, in terms of the boarding school, uh, maybe two or three of them remaining, and those are in Mississippi. It, it, yeah, I don't know if you, you know. actually know that or not. Is that still the case? As yeah, far that's as you still know? the case. Uh, Piney Woods may be the oldest. And uh, man, you know that school okay. saved that school really saved my life. As far as uh, you know, once I learned how to put basketball and school together, you know, I became unstoppable, man. But I had to, you know, the discipline, you know, going to class from eight to five p.m. Um, then you know, getting out of class, going to practice from like six to nine. Then you got to uh, shower, you got to study, and do it all over again for four years, man. You know, it was just. Yeah, man, it, like I said, it was great going to school there. I uh, met a lot of great people. I'm going to let Charles jump in here and ask you a little bit uh, as he's on the other side of that ride with Jack State. So I'm going <laughs> to let him have a little fun before we yeah. can get a little more into it. I, I, I know you to be a humble guy, but you were one of the top players, uh, not just in the state of Mississippi, but in the country. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. that made huge uh, headlines at the time in terms of, of you choosing the HBCU. But uh, now you've, you've uh, transitioned now uh, it, as, as far as uh, director of player development. Uh, talk a little mm -hmm. bit about this company that you're working with and what you guys are doing right now. Um, you know, Driven Elite, uh, man, with my partner, my brother, uh, Donald Driver, you know, he's the owner of Driven Elite, man. We, we, we got together, put a plan together. Um, and, and we just went forward with it, man. You know, I, our thing is we want, we, we care about people and we love helping people, you know, uh, especially young ladies, young guys, you know, because we were once that young, uh, young guy, you know what I'm saying? Just like these kids that we have today. And then we added Mahmoud abdul Raouf to the, to the piece as well, man. So, you know, man, I think right now we can be, we can be unstoppable. Uh, with, with the things that we're doing and because we care and it's genuine. And I think, you know, the word that we use a lot right now is uh, authentic, man. No doubt, no doubt. And for people who don't know, Mahmoud abdul Rauf, <laughs> he, was, he was the Steph Curry before there was Steph Curry. I mean, oh, yeah. in terms of uh, <laughs> yeah. just his legendary exploits uh, in, in the state of Mississippi, one of the just absolute best basketball players I've ever watched in my lifetime. And then you got an opportunity to see what he did at LSU and then on to the pros. But uh, it's tremendous that you have that sort of individual working with you uh, yeah. in terms of tr uh, trying to work with the talent. Uh, you guys recently held uh, a pro day for, for women's uh, basketball players. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, man. So we, you know, um, like I say, Donna and I, you know, when, when we got together, we said, you know, man, we want to do something for the young ladies and try to help them, you know, further their careers. Uh, you know, the first two years, it's been just players going overseas. But then our training uh, picked up, you know, uh, during the pandemic, you know, once they, uh, once the governor allowed us to uh, get back in the gyms, man, I started getting young ladies from schools all over the country, the Texas A&Ms and the Texas Techs and the uh, Southern Mist. And, man, it was kids coming from all over to come train with us. And then, you know, that's when we said, hey, man, we're going to, we're going to take this combine pro day stuff to another level. And this year, you know, we were able to uh, have WNBA coaches and that only, you know, solidified, you know, what we're doing. And, um, you know, we had the two young ladies from Jackson State, you know, they coming off a near upset of LSU and their names are hot. You know, they still hot right now. So, man, I made it my business, you know, to reach out to the powers that be and say, hey, you know, we got to get these swag kids in here as well to, you know, to have them mm. competing against power five kids and, and things of that nature. So, you know, I'm a swag guy and I know what it's like to, you know, um, you know, feel slighted, you know, so I wanted to help them, you know, not feel like, Hey man, our season is over. Uh, you know, this is it. But, you know, so we was just fortunate and blessed enough 
to have uh, those coaches come in and have those two young ladies uh, show up for pro day. That's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome story. That is the 2022 Driven Elite Pro Day, uh, which was held in Duncanville Fieldhouse in Duncanville, Texas. And anybody from Texas or Duncanville, especially North Texas, knows about uh, the high school programs and the power of basketball played there. So right. just the synergy and connection about the seriousness of basketball in that area mm -hmm. is significant. But before we do that, I didn't want to – I'd be remiss if we didn't go in and talk a little bit about – you before we go back and really talk about how this camp mm. comes together and, and maybe the quality of what they were able to bring to the table is you talked about, you know, how feeling about being slighted right. uh, is the term that you use. And, and there's a reason for that. Talk about how talent everybody said you were, you know, this is not about you saying yourself, this is what everything out there, the papers right. were saying. And you chose Alcorn, which we see maybe a little bit of that going back again. Talk about mm -hmm. the importance of you making that decision, why you made that decision. Uh, give us a little insight so people can start understanding why that story needs to be told. Well, for me, uh, man, a lot of guys from Mississippi, you know, they were, you know, going to a lot of Power Five schools and they weren't playing. And, and I'm, and I'm mm -hmm. sitting back and I'm like, man, you know, are they better than me or am I better than them? You know, I didn't say anything like that. I'm like, man, that could happen to me, you know, if I choose to go to one of these schools and things of the nature. But the coach that recruited me at Alcorn to come to Alcorn, Sam Weaver, he never felt like he couldn't get me. So mm -hmm. when I go to the top camps in the, uh, uh, in America, ABCD and the Kreider camps, mm -hmm. he was right there amongst the Giants. He was there with Coach K. He was there with uh, John Thompson. I'm like, man, this dude following me everywhere I go. So I built that relationship <laughs> with him. And um, this is what's crazy. Even though I'm from Mississippi, I really didn't know much about Alcorn. Like, I, 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 you know, only knew about what I saw on TV. You know what I'm saying? So I really just didn't know, like, the history of the school and, and things of that nature. I, I remember, you know, hearing how dominant the basketball program and things of that nature was, like, in the late 70s early 80s so uh at that time when i signed they was kind of struggling so i'm like man i want to blaze my own trail you know i don't want to do what my other friends doing and follow them to school and, and things and i'm gonna be my own guy even if i even if it means i'm about to sacrifice it all to do what's best for me and you know hey when i look back at it now uh, even though i didn't play you know one game in the nba i think i still had a successful career uh, I'm in the Hall of Fame at All Corn. I think, you know, what I'm doing now, in, uh, you know, like some of my friends say, just impacting lives, that to me has uh, succeeded in anything I've ever done uh, on the court. That's just, you know, that's just my opinion. You know, you know, some people may not feel that way, but. No, that's real talk. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's how I everybody feel. doesn't get a chance. Yeah, that's right. Everybody doesn't get a chance to affect the lives, right? Right. And those that do have two choices. Right. Right, that they will affect lives or they want, and if right. they do affect lives, they have a chance to do it positive or negative. You're mm -hmm. doing it positively, so we're gonna celebrate that and accentuate that. So we believe in it too, uh, Coach yes, Brian Adams. I'm gonna use that terminology, a director of player development. Talk a little bit about what goes on in these camps. Um, you know, man, we're just trying to, you know, uh, see what's what's really. On film, you know, we, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much the person that goes out and pick the players and target, you know, certain players uh, to come to the camp. You know, I watch a lot of film, you know, but I want to see it in person. I want to see when you get here, uh, what's your strengths, what's your weaknesses, you know, because one thing about it, man, when you're in the gym with Mahmoud abdul Rose, like he going to push different buttons that I may not push. And he's going to, you know, exploit your weaknesses. You might not be able to go left. You might not be great going right. You might mm -hmm. not be able to, you know, do certain things. So, um, you know, on that level, uh, on the professional level, man, you know, your, your weaknesses will be exposed if you have them, you know. So we're just here to help players uh, understand the, the nature of this pro, uh, this professional basketball stuff. Um, and like I say, we're just trying to get the most out of them in a few days that they're here.
with your expertise, you know, we're fans. We watch it on TV. We watch mm-hmm. it so often. Some of us are blessed to play, whether, you know, AAU. Some of us even make it to the high school level, play, you know. And then if we're fortunate, you got some to play at the college level, Division One, Power Five. And you have that talent intent to play at the professional level. And then those superstars. Mm-hmm. As you've been around this game and you've watched, what are some of the things that you look at in terms of the attributes of mm-hmm. what those that just are entertained by it may not pick up that we need to consider and maybe watch a little more of uh, that you see from a professional perspective of really dissecting this game? Um, I would say, you know, um, Man, how well do someone, how well does a player handle adversity? You know, uh, what type of player are they, you know, whether they up 20 or down 20? That's the that's the part that fans don't get a chance to see. You know what I'm saying? I get a chance to see what type of player they are, how they interact with teammates, uh, you know, uh, how they interact. Do they take instruction well from coaches, you know, and things of that nature? Because we don't really know a lot of these players that come here, but, you know, uh, that's one of the things that we try to see, you know, uh, once they get here, you know, how, you know, how well do they love basketball or your gym rat, things of that nature. So it's more of the mental part too, you know, we know what you can do physically, but, you know, we just try to see different things, you know, uh, from the mental aspect while you're here as well. Last question I have to you, for you, <clears throat> and Charles may want to jump in here with a final question as well. So sure, sure. you put this together, but last, Last question I have for you is, you know, you put these significant professional camps in where scouts come in and really dissect and do mm-hmm. all this work. Is there a component where you actually do personal training? And if you do that, yeah. you know, how do people get involved about being able to contact you to do personal training? Well, that's uh, the personal training is what really led to all of this, you know, um, you know, um, they can contact me, you know, um, on Twitter, you know, D Elite uh, B Ball. Um, and then on Instagram, it's uh, Driven Elite Basketball Academy. So, you know, word of mouth travel, man. And like I say, you say know, say it again. Word just of mouth. Time. Yeah, can you word of mouth travels? You know? No, just say the contacts. How to, on Twitter, oh. what is your Twitter again? Yeah, Twitter is uh, uh, D Elite B Ball. Uh, Capital D, capital E, L I T E, B ball uh, on Twitter. And then on Instagram is Driven Elite Basketball Academy. Awesome. Great stuff. Charles, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to follow up and, and talk about a couple of ladies who, who came in. Uh, uh, Amisha Williams Holiday, 6'5 post player for Jackson mm-hmm. State, uh, SWAC uh, Player of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year. And then you also had Deja Rogan. Uh, uh, point guard for Jackson State, uh, all swag performer. Talk a little bit about uh, their performance at this camp. Oh, man. I mean, as soon as they got off the plane and, and got in the gym, it's like people knew who they who they were because, uh, you know, the game against LSU. And um, mm. both of them, they, they are bona fide pros. Uh, we just don't know, you know, at what level uh, right now. I'm, um, I think more, you know, right now because of her size, uh, uh, Williams probably get more looks, you know, for the WNBA or whatever. But um, I can break down both of their games. Like, Rogan is lightning fast. Man, I didn't know she was that fast. Uh, she can run a team. Uh, she going to pick you up 94 feet. She can guard. Uh, I think she was the best on-ball defender, you know, at the camp. And she can knock jumpers down. And once, once she get a steal, it's over with. You're not catching her. You know what I'm saying? So – but she had big games against um, Power Five opponents. And then, you know, you just never know what a coach is looking for. You know, uh, she may be someone to come in and plug a hole, you know, for eight to ten minutes or so. Uh, um, you just never know. And, and with Amisha, is her motor, you know. Uh, she has a high motor um, for her size. Su- superb athleticism. Nice touch around the rim. Um, she had – several 15, 20 point, re- I mean, 20 rebound games. So with her, you know, you're talking about somebody with a motor that can come in and feel a, if they just need somebody to rebound, set screens and, and, and defend, 
you know, um, I think she can fit a, a, a role, you know, in the WNBA for sure. You know, because at this point, you know, one thing I explained to the kids, you probably was that person in college, but they got somebody right now for that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So can, can you fit, can you fill a role? Because if not, you know, this is not going to work. If you come in thinking I got to be the man or the woman from day one, this ain't going to work because this is, this is a different level now. You know, so my thing is I'm trying to get them the, the, the mentality of, okay, I can make a team just by if they just need me to rebound or defend set screens. You see? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. With that, uh, before we let you go, we know your time is valuable and want to again say thank you for this opportunity to really get yeah. a different perspective of what it looks like getting in the game of basketball. Mm-hmm. Anything else that we want to – that you want to share that we weren't able to ask you. Uh, man, I would just say, you know, man, uh, we, we love the support. Um, I thought that was a great article uh, that they wrote, you know, for the SI.com, you know, talking about pro day and, um, you know, how it went under the radar and, and things of that nature, man. I thought it was a great event, you know, and now, uh, I'm going to say, man, this, this will be the last year. It's under the radar. We're going to be over the radar next time. You know? <laughs> so, there you go. But, uh, but no, man, hey, I, I shared it with Mahmoud and Donald, and they loved it, man. And we just got to keep it. We just got to keep it moving. And, you know, whatever I can do to help any young lady, uh, especially those, uh, those kids uh, from the HBCUs that may not get those looks during the season, you know, uh, you know, that's going to be great, too, because, you know, I, I got on the phone and, uh, you know, used my contacts and said, hey, man, have y'all seen this kid from Jackson State? Have y'all seen this kid, you know, uh, from other schools and things of that nature? And they was like, oh, man, we got to we got to check them out. Because one of the coaches from the WNBA, when she when I released the list, she was like, oh, yeah, I want to see Jackson State. I want to see them there. You know, mm. and that, I was like, man, that was, that's that's awesome, man. That is. That's, that's yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm so glad you shared that point because it's important to tell that story and tell our story and tell that collective story, if you would, uh, about yeah. how people think and feel because you don't always hear that. That article was written by Kyle T. Mosley. That's Jackson State's Williams Holiday and Rogan uh, Excel at Pro Day. So go check it out. Google it, SISportsIllustrated.com. If you wanted, uh, if you hadn't seen the article, great information. Want to say thank you for your time, Brian Adams. Wanky as they oh, yeah. say, uh, uh, from day one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We'll have you back and get in there and we'll keep up with you as things continue to move and wish you the best moving forward. Thank you so much for your time. We're going to take this break and we'll be right back as we get into the third quarter as we extended a little bit of that first half of the show. Are you hungry for authentic Caribbean food? Like jerk chicken, oxtail, red snapper, shrimp, tofu, and rasta pasta? Well, find your way over to Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Pika in downtown Atlanta. Them belly full, but we hungry. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, open daily from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And on Friday and Saturday, we're open till 4 a.m. Come to Mango's and put some spice in your life. So we've got a good Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. For more info or directions, call 404-698-3992. Or log on to mangoscaribbeanrestaurant.com. For instant coupons, text M-A-N-G-O-S to 313131. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant. Authentic Caribbean cuisine. For 200 years, Montgomery, Alabama has been making history by people who had the courage to stand up for change. Today, this riverfront city has been reborn, embracing the past and looking forward to the future. From the National Memorial for Peace and Justice to the stage of the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, this is where history was and is made. We are proud to call Montgomery home, and together, we can be the change. Charmin Ultra Soft has so much cushiony softness, it's hard for your family to remember. They can use less. Sweet pillows of softness. This is soft. Holy Charmin. Oh, excuse me. Roll it back, everybody. Sorry. 
Charmin Ultra Soft is so cushiony soft, you'll want more. But it's so absorbent, you can use less. So it's always worth it. Now, what did we learn about using less? You gotta roll it back, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we all go. Why not enjoy the go with Charmin? From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service with Slow Burn. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. It's more than a mobile lounge, it's an environment and an experience rich in history, luxury, and personality. An elegant extension of any celebration occasion. It's the perfect escape and meeting place. A space where you can relax or enjoy a shared passion. Have Slow Burn plan your next big event or before you are planning to celebrate your win over your athletic rival, you can shop our collections at www.slowburnwaco.com. But if they want to tap, uh, I'm going to do the dab, yeah. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want to lose, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Let's get in a little bit of this baseball, the meat of the baseball, some uh, games coming this weekend and getting into third week. So we maybe we can start to see some separation. I think people have made some early statements, but it's still kind of early. You know, we just getting into the first half of the first half. So what is that? A quarter of way through maybe? Yeah, you know, yeah. Say a little bit in that mix. Uh, in terms of at least the, the uh, SWAC, MEAC, obviously less teams. So they get right into the meat really fast in terms of what they get going on. So I want to share a little bit about the MEAC uh, before we Spend more time in terms of the depth of the swag in some of those games coming on this weekend. So this weekend, what's up in terms of the baseball? Obviously, you had the weekend series. You had uh, games played yesterday with George Washington defeating Maryland Eastern Shore. That was 8-3. to three. Uh, Coppin State put up some runs, but not enough to see Georgetown as Georgetown got it done against Coppin State 17-11. to 11. Uh, But what you see going on, uh, some of the – Players getting it done, Sebastian, Siberia, in terms of the batting average, batting 347, Ryan Howe, Maryland, Eastern Shore, all these guys at 333 continue to get it done. Uh, but some of the uh, matchups that we're going to be looking at this week should be fascinating to kind of uh, see what's going on in terms of those big games. Uh, anything that stands out to you, some matchups in the MEAC this weekend that you want to keep your eyes on, Charles? Um, not, not so much matchups in the MEAC that uh... – uh, you got really, Coppin State and uh, Maryland show. You don't want to get into this Baltimore well, well, rivalry, you know. Well, 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 I think Coppin State, you know, should be able to take care of business this weekend with, with regards to Maryland Eastern Shore. But uh, I think yeah. they've thus far been kind of the class up there. Uh, to me, the fight is going to be always uh, with Coppin State and Norfolk State up there. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what they get into. Well, yeah, the, you got talking about Norfolk State. They take on Delaware State, so Delaware State is at the bottom, but this is either a chance for Delaware State to find a way to jump back in there, but they're struggling all year long. So really, Norfolk State, if they're going to make sure they can keep up and hold on to their end of the bargain of what they did to win the uh, conference tournament last year, this is a chance where they really need to make a statement. They really need to get three out of four, if not all four games. Um, obviously, they're not at the, on the road, so they're at home. So you really want to take advantage when you're talking about the home uh, section of what takes in place. So – I think it's interesting in terms of those matchups going on there. Um, any players that you see with the batting average, uh, pitches, anybody that's standing out uh, from that framework, obviously when you talk about Black College Nines as they released the poll last week, um, in terms of the top ten, you have Coppin last week, the 7-12, obviously they played games since then. Last time when they had the poll, they went 5-3 and three over that period of time. RPI is 285, ranked seven. Uh, um, and then you have Norfolk State uh, at number 10. And that's 5-12 and 12 on the season. Uh, during the week of the poll, they were evaluated over the two-week period, two period. They were 2-6. They were previous ranked 9, so they dropped the spot. RPI 287 to give you some indication of some of the teams uh, in terms of the uh, uh, who's ranked. So you see them at the bottom half of the 10. 
And so they have a lot of room that they're trying to build to make the statement to see if they can itch back up there with the teams in the SWAC, which we'll get in a little more, that are really carrying the day of the top 10 poll rankings when we talk about the black college nines uh, as we release, as we get ready to vote for next week's poll. What was Coppin State's uh, RPI? RPI was 285. Okay. Okay. That uh, 285 and, and yeah, it's where, compared, where is it would if, we, if you go to the top, uh, which ranked uh, Alabama State, and again, this is not including what took place this past weekend or uh, the midweek games, but at that time, the RPI was 199. So you got one just above 200. Texas Southern is like 268. Bethune Cookman at 208 to give you a couple of That's why I was looking teams. for Texas Southern. Yeah, where, where were they in, in regards to RPI to Coppin State? So. Yeah, and that's where you kind of see it. Uh, you have Texas Southern at 268 versus uh, Coppin State at 285. So you see a significant jump there, 20, on, right under 20 points uh, when you start talking about what's looking up there. So that's fascinating when you start talking about RPI rankings, uh, where teams are when you start looking at the teams out of the MEAC versus those teams in the SWAC. Gotcha. Well, I tell Let's you get into the board. Let's look a little more in terms of the SWAC. Talk about some of those key matchups. Who catches your eye this weekend when you talk about some of those big games in the SWAC? Before we do that, what are your thoughts of Texas Southern getting it done against Talton on the road and really pounding them pretty solid? What are your thoughts on that? Good midweek win for uh, Texas Southern. That, that caught my eye in terms of what they were able to do. Of course, they, they're just scoring runs left and right, and then they're stealing bases left and right as well. Uh, they – uh, I, I'm not saying they peaked early, but, you know, normally we see them really kind of put their foot on the gas toward the, the back end of the season. So to see them playing so well uh, early in the season, I mean, it bodes well for them going through uh, this baseball season. They're a fun team to watch as well. They put the ball in play, and then when they get on base, they can be real scared. Then you had Bethune Cookman defeat Stetson yesterday. You know, the game we talked about, that was Texas Southern on Tuesday. You had Bethune Cookman. Defeat Stetson 7-6. Um, Mackney State just gets by Southern 9-7. So it's good to see some of these regional uh, matchups, if you would, from these midweek games. Uh, you see the SWAC winning some games. Even the games that are not winning are still close. So it's fascinating to see. What are your thoughts in terms of what that looks like? There? Uh, I always take a look at who's pitching in these midweek games and, and where they are within the rotation, you know, whether they're able to hold up uh, for a team, uh, especially when, once you get into – uh, your weekend play and, and things of that nature, or, or do they have quality arms that are sitting back there in the bullpen? Because those those arms are, are are throwing during the course of the mid, uh, midweek game. So uh, great wins both for uh, uh, Southern and Bethune Cookman. Yep, yeah. Murray State defeat Alabama A&M seven three. Prairie View did get it done against Wilder College fourteen to three. Um, so that was fascinating when you talk. Valley put up 20 runs you against Tougaloo. I said Valley put up 20 runs against Tougaloo. It was like the first time in 20-some-odd years they had put up that many amount of runs. So, And then that leads me to kind of keep an eye on this weekend series as Bethune Cookman goes to Mississippi Valley. But, but before you get in there, I'm going to let you go in there. We're going to take a break. We'll come back and get into some of these swag matchups. Uh, before we do that, the score of that Texas Southern game over Talton, for those that are not aware of it, was 11-7. We're going to take our last break and come back, and then we're going to get into some of these matchups in the SWAC for this weekend where you can talk about that Valley and Pine Bluff, you know, and Tougaloo and those different matchups about Valley. Yeah, Valley putting up points, uh, making it interesting. Uh, we'll give you a chance to talk a little bit more and maybe uh, give a little more shine. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. Oh, that spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure. It's wireless. Pick something we all like. Okay, hold on. The all-new Buick Envision, an SUV built around you, all of you. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, 
and parenting education coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lesson. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. As you know, Mike Washington is out on assignment, but I'm here with Professor Bishop. Time to let him show out a little bit. Let's get into some of this baseball. You've been itching and you've been trying to throw it out here and there. Now we're going to get a chance to show out a little bit. Let's go over these standings real quick to remind folks. You got the East. Bethune Cookman sits at 5-1. and one. Uh, They had that three-game series, obviously against Alabama State. They took two out of three. They did lost, lose, I should say. Uh, the last game on Sunday of the series. So you have Alabama State sitting at four and two. You have both AMU and Alabama A&M sitting at three and three. Mississippi Valley uh, holding steady. They're at two and four. And Jackson State surprising everybody at one and five. It is still early. In the West, you have Texas Southern sitting at five and one. And then you have a gauntlet of teams, four of them to be exact, all sitting at three and three. That's Prairie View A&M, Arkansas Pine Bluff, Grambling State, and Southern. This is surprise some sitting at three and three. Alcorn State did get the win, so they had one and five uh, in terms of what goes on there. Some of your key matchups this weekend, starting tomorrow, we have FAMU and Alabama A&M in Huntsville, as well, our lab listeners share with us uh, because of some weather issues. That game will be moved in terms of the facility, so we'll get that updated there. You have on the road to Arkansas Pine Bluff. Uh, you have Bethune Cookman on the road in Mississippi Valley. New experience there. So that should be fascinating to keep you guys on. Jackson State, can they make a move? They're on the road. So if they're going to do it, it's going to be now in terms of being able to get it. It'd be a hard time, but it certainly would be a statement if they can make it. Or will Alabama State keep pace in a lot of ways with Bethune Cookman unless the Delta Devils can make a statement there? That is in Montgomery. Grambling State at Alcorn State, Norman, Mississippi. It goes back in terms of that Mississippi-Louisiana rivalry there. So it'll be fascinating to see in terms of some mixes there. And this becomes a divisional matchup. You used to see this midweek games if they would play or just a series over the weekend. But now it counts for the division. And then you have the big one. Yeah, I shared this the last for a little bit here. Texas Southern goes on the road to Baton Rouge to Southern. Always a classic matchup over the last 10, 15 years between these two teams, whether it's in the regular season for divisional rights or whether it's in the tournament. Right now it's division. What do you say, Charles? What do you want to tackle first? Uh, let's go. I think this is a pivotal weekend. Jackson State and Alabama State, two of the better pitching uh, staffs in the swag. Jackson State comes in, Team ERA 494, Alabama State uh, a five ERA as one of the top pitchers in the SWAC in Breon Pooler. Uh, so uh, this should be a fascinating matchup this weekend. Uh, the question becomes, can, can Jackson State score some runs? They are uh, right now, you don't normally see them sort of in the, in the, in the, in the median, if you will, in terms of, of SWAC hitting. Remember, Jackson State comes in as a team hitting 265. They're right. normally in that top three. So uh, they've had some injuries thus far uh, early this season. Uh, they've had some issues uh, winning series. Uh, they've dropped series of Bethune, Cookman, and Alabama A&M. So this is going to be a huge uh, weekend for Jackson State to see if they can, uh, you know, overcome that Alabama State traditionally tough pitch. And then yeah, we'll I'm take fascinated a, a little yeah. bit about that. I'm fascinated a little bit about that FAMU, Alabama A&M. You know, I'm always curious when you have these 
new games where now there are divisional matchups that haven't taken place prior to the expansion of the SWAT. So I like the games that you talked about because they're going to be fascinating. Uh, but I'm interested in FAMU, Alabama, and m Obviously, where they, they are three and three in the standings, so somebody's going to get at least a little bit of edge, if not, you know, a clear edge in terms of depending on what they're able to do this week. Um, so I'm fascinated with that. Obviously, the Bethune-Cookman Valley that's playing much better baseball than we've seen in the past couple of years, right? Um, if Valley get one game in this three-game series, that's going to be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It lets you know that it's certainly changed, turning in the right di- direction. It makes it interesting in terms of the SWAC is taking the top four teams in the division. It keeps that more interesting in terms of what that looks like. And it makes a statement to everybody else uh, that you're going to have to come to play Valley. And then Bethune Cookman, for their credit, they like sitting at the top, sitting at five and one. Um, and so they want to keep space and maybe stretch it out if they can. So I agree with you. That's one to really keep your eyes on in terms of what that looks like. Uh, you have a full slate on Saturday, and then you have a couple of these closing games on Sunday. What are your thoughts in terms of the Friday, Saturday, Sunday look that they, the conference has moved to over the last couple of years? You know, we used to do the Friday, the doubleheader on Saturday, or used to see the Saturday doubleheaders, then one on Sunday. What are you thoughts in terms of as you've seen this over the last couple of years? It's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday framework for the conference. Well, just in talking to a couple of coaches, I mean, they they like this Friday, Saturday, Sunday uh, versus taxing their arms in terms of playing a doubleheader and, and teams kind of uh, staggering toward the finish line uh, as you get uh, towards tournament time. Uh, just in the uh, um, amount of innings that they played, you know, back in the day on those on those Saturday days. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's good. It's always interesting that Friday night matchup because you have normally have two of the better arms going at Friday night. And it's that momentum. It's that momentum uh, night. You know, you get that uh, that first Friday win. It can take you into the weekend, if you will. So uh, it should be uh, fascinating matchups, I think, with uh, especially Texas Southern going to Southern. Texas Southern has been – uh, like I said, tearing the cover off the ball, batting 334. And then <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm keep looking up at this stat. They've stolen 119 bases. And, you know, I got an opportunity to see a little bit of that uh, last weekend when they played Arkansas Pine Bluff uh, as they took that series against Arkansas Pine Bluff. But when they get on base, I always take a look down there. They're, they're, they're quarter away down to second. <laughs> they're, head, they're, they're trying to steal bases. They're trying to, you know, uh, go station to station. So it's fun watching Texas Southern play baseball. Roger Coffey is one heck of a ball player. Great point. And before we do that, we'll turn it just a little bit and we'll close it on this. Uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't touch a little bit on the football. Everybody's getting excited. Grammar State, black and gold spring game. They're really excited. Hugh Jackson, obviously, gets the first time to be on the sideline and do what he does. Um, you have some other folks who are doing a little bit of the spring games. You have these uh, – Junior days uh, that have been coming up really popular. You got Jackson State as they get ready to get up on their uh, spring game as well. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of what's taking place in the football landscape of the SWAC? Give you a little bit of a minute to either talk a little bit about Grambling and how excited you hear them, and just in general, the overall thematic approach of the SWAC right now from a football perspective as we're entering into these pro days, these junior days in spring fall. Oh. Yeah, hope spring's eternal in the spring. I mean, I, everybody's really excited about their programs. Uh, I, I mean, when you take a look at uh, Grandma's football program uh, with Hugh Jackson uh, injecting life back into that program again, but you got to have a signal caller. They've got to find somebody that's going to be a signal caller to Grandma. Uh, I was reading a great article as far as Tennessee State. They were going through the same thing in terms of uh, who's going to be the man under the center uh, at Tennessee State. So a lot of fascinating questions. Uh, Jackson State, how will their offensive line look? Uh, you could say that that was the 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 Achilles heel of Jackson State last season, especially as it got toward the latter part of the uh, of the season in terms of protecting Shador Sanders. But uh, and you know there I think there are a lot of questions with Jackson State defensively. Who's going to replace 16 and a half sacks from James Houston? So uh, you got questions all about. But there's enough excitement that really propels you into the spring game, and you know you get to see a few touchdowns, you get to see the ball fly around a little bit. You know, it, it takes you through the summer. I, I enjoy it. No doubt about it. Got four new coaches, essentially either new to um, the team itself or new to the institution, 
in regards to changing the round. So it'll be fascinating as those coaches get a chance uh, to put their thematic approach together in the spring ball as they lead into the uh, over the summer, as you said, to get us ready for some fall football. Can't seem to get here close enough, but we're going to relax. We get a chance to do this baseball, and it certainly is entertaining. That'll do it for us. I want to say this is Dr. Bill Inside HBC Sports Lab. Thank you for listening to Inside HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Kabil, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Hope you enjoy uh, the show and the interview with Brian. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock. Since the standard time, we look forward to next week as we discuss the latest news in the lab. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. That's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter. Facebook and YouTube is Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you subscribe and like it. And continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles? Of course. Roy? Lecture. <laughs> Dismissed.